I admit so. When we ask somebody doing something right, it's good. Which reminds me of a story, by the way. Real quick, there was a, uh, you know, these two little boys lived in this town, one named Kirk, one named Brian. They were 18 years old. Yeah, two little boys, Kirk and Brian. And they, <laughs> they lived in this town, and they were known for their mischief, always getting into trouble. As a matter of fact, they got into trouble so often their parents knew if anything went wrong in town, these two boys had something to do with it. So one day, the mother heard there was a preacher coming to the town who was pretty good at working with these young kids, particularly young boys, you know. And she said, well, I want you to work with my young boys. And he said, well, I'll do that. I'd like to meet with them separately, one at a time, though. She said, okay. So she made an appointment for the younger one, then an appointment for the older one. Went in to see the preacher. He was a big man, boisterous voice, you know. And he sat down and said, son, do you know where God is? And the little boy looked at him, eyes open, and didn't say a word. He said, well, son, I'm talking to you. Voice got a little louder and said, do you know where God is? And the little boy looked at him, mouth wide open. He said, well, son, I'm going to ask you one more time. Where is God? The little boy jumped up, screamed. He ran out the door, flew home, dived in the closet, and shut the door. When his older brother found him, he opened up the door. He said, man, we've really done it this time. God's missing. And they think we did it. <laughs> This is a good opportunity we have here. We got on something that's been done right. And I think I've got two people here who know who did it, uh, have something to do with it. So it's wonderful to have this opportunity uh, to introduce to you today uh, Ms. Kathy Reagan for the Texas office and uh, David Rue, who's here in place of uh, Dr. Angie Patton, who's also supervisor of the numerator down there, who've done some special stuff on the arms. And uh, we want them to come and tell us about it. I had the opportunity to go down to the Texas uh, uh, office and join them at the, the workshop last June. Uh, we were celebrating the uh, uh, 50 years of Stacy Parker working. He's a supervisor of the who's worked with us for 50 years. And, uh, and I learned about what these folks were doing down in Texas and said, well, you folks got to come up here. And I shared this with, uh, with the folks over at CSD. And, Sure enough, they invited them up, and so they're here today uh, to share with us some of the work that they've done and some of the success that they, they are having with arms. So, Kathy, David, turn it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. Once again, I am Kathy Reagan, field supervisor from Texas. I've been working 32 years there. I have about 24 enumerators, and we will complete 300 questionnaires before this arms is over with, or near that. And Tanisha will be very proud of us. Okay. The person with me is David Roy, and I'm going to ask him to come up here now because I'm going to start it just a little bit different than what I planned. Because usually, you know, you get these questions at the end. But I got a really good question right at the beginning. Just don't know whether that's good or bad. But I'm going to ask that person, and that's Matt, to please stand because this question, if we don't get this right to begin with, this introduction, then it's not going to go good during the rest of the questionnaire. So Matt had asked a question, and I'm going to ask him to ask that of David. Now, David is a field enumerator. He is one of the best I've ever known, so we are very lucky to have him. He's been working eight years with us, and he, 30 years prior to that, he worked as a county agent for the state of Texas. So we have really a good person here working doing this. So Matt, if you would ask that question, David is prepared to answer that for you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, my question was, what was you know, with your experience and with the uh, reluctancy that a lot of these farmers have to fill out such a big questionnaire, what is your what did you what do you find is your best uh, icebreaker to get in to get the farmer to complete this survey and you know agree to do it? Okay, we got a, uh, a short turnaround on this, but uh, this is the way I handle it when I go out to a producer. I, when I drive up to their house. I go out and the first thing I do is I introduce myself. When I walk out there, I reach out there, I sh shake their hand, and then I hand them my business card. And then I tell them, uh, 
that I work for Texas Ag Statistical Services, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I think that's important to let them know who you work for. I tell them that we're conducting a agriculture resource management survey and that we're gathering information on income and expenses for the farm operations. Uh, and that this uh, survey allows them to provide the input into the survey. All the information is confidential. Nothing ever comes out about their individual farm. Uh, all the information is summarized uh, for the state of Texas and for the uh, nation, for the United States, uh, and that they represent a cross-section of similar producers for their particular commodity. I also tell them that it's going to take about an hour to an hour and a half to complete the survey. <laughs> that uh, I'd like to set up an appointment to come back at a later date to, to do the survey with them. Ideally, we'll work out a deal where we might sit down right there on the spot and do it, and that would be the ideal thing to do. And sometimes we, we do sit down and, and do the interview, but sometimes, many times, you have to come back at their convenience, because a lot of times you catch them at a time when they're not, you know, at their best talking to you. Uh, I tell them, too, that if they have any kind of farm records, uh, sometimes I say their income tax records will do, because that gives us a starting point. Once we sit down with, with the farms, we can take that IRS record and, and we can ask questions from there and fill out that, that uh, survey as far as I'm concerned. And then uh, if I get a date set with them, I thank them for the time and I, I leave. Now sometimes that takes five minutes, sometimes it'll take maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. You may visit with them a little bit. Okay. Okay, David, don't go away because you're going to be here for questions here in a little while. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about how to avoid a refusal to begin with. The first thing is try to avoid being on that telephone. You need to eye-to-eye -eye contact if you can. There are exceptions, but that is the best way, is to go out there in person and do like David said, try to set up an appointment. Don't push them right then. Okay. The next thing, and the most important thing, in the morning when you get up, you get up with a good attitude. You know you're going to do arms. You get up with that attitude, you're going to get that arms. <coughs> Excuse me. And you dress appropriate, act appropriate. That's very important. When you get in your car, don't look tearing down that road, throwing dirt all over the place. <laughs> Have respect for everything. Little things matter. Go up there, do what David said, introduce yourself. You got two minutes, actually. You got two minutes to sell this. That's what you're doing, you're selling yourself. If you don't get up there, have that introduction down, be prepared to tell them why this is important, why it's gonna help you. Everybody wants to know what's in it for me. Have those answers ready. So when they ask you, well, why should I do this? How is this gonna help me? You better have some answers there. Be ready to tell them, okay? The next thing that you do is you tell them the truth about how long this is going to take. You go up there sometimes and you'll start talking to the people and after 30 minutes, it's like, well, how long is this gonna take? I don't have time for this. Stop that right off the bat. Tell them that it may take an hour, but we wanna get it accurate. You see what I'm saying? You're not gonna get stopped because of the length at that time. Also tell them right up front, I'm going to ask you some personal questions or what seems to be personal questions in here. However, they are very important to get the whole picture. Because when you tell them that, that'll keep them from stopping you in the middle of it and saying, well, that don't have anything to do with agriculture. Yes, it does. Because when we ask them such things as how much debt they have, how much money is brought into that house besides what the farm produces, how much their spouse makes, how much money they got in the bank, how much they have in CDs, their IRAs, their oil or gas royalties. We're asking a lot of questions there, but you've got to get them to the point where they want to give you those answers. And let me tell you how you do that. You tell them, we've got the farm bill out here. We've got all these things going for us. If we just come in here and it looks like you had that real expensive cotton this year, you have these cattle that sell real big. 
we're not going to be picking up the fact that there was other monies coming in. Would this farm or ranch really be able to operate if somebody wasn't bringing some money from an outside source? And you know what they're going to say every time? Well, that's the truth. I sure couldn't make it on this. <laughs> also, we're going to pick up your any kind of payments from the government. Would it be able to operate without that? Well, they sure wouldn't. If they ever cut them out, I'm a goner. See, you've turned it around to where they want to tell you those things. Whereas if you wait till you get there and get to that point, they're going to say, don't be asking me those personal questions. I thought you were with USDA. I thought this. Stop that before it starts. Make them want to tell the sad story. Don't they want to tell you how much debt they've got after you tell them that? How it's going to be used? It's very important. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else? Another thing, tell them right up front, right behind that, say, now, when I start asking this, if I ask you a question that makes you feel uncomfortable, please don't answer it. One question can stop this whole process. And when you get to that question, if they say, oh, no, I'm not going to answer that, say, I understand, go to the next question. Don't let us ruin this whole questionnaire because they didn't want to answer one of them. So that is a really good thing to follow up on. Okay. Now, you're going to go out there and you're going to do all of this. You've done everything just exactly right. You have gotten up with a good attitude. You've gone out there. You have talked to this person in a professional, every kind of way that you know how to handle it. And sometimes they're still going to refuse you. But we got to tell those enumerators that right up front. Don't go out there expecting to get everything, but expect to get most of it. So if they know right up front, and I'm going to eventually tell you what my plan is on that, and you got to tell them right, that right up front. But up front you tell them, I do not want you to go home wasting your time crying, intimidated, mad or feeling bad about this. This is your job, and you're going to get one. So if you think you're not, may as well not even go out there, because you're going to get it. So what, would, what causes us to be a good or a bad enumerator or worker for NAS or NASCA? How do we handle it after that? So I got to thinking several years ago. I work in my office some, and I was looking at some of the questionnaires, and you know what it had written on the top of it? Refusal, sent in, no comments, nothing. Got to deal with that in the office, and that's going to make our, our accounts go down. Okay. I got to thinking, you know, we're not really doing our job. I, I think that maybe NASDAQ's not fulfilling all their agreement. Maybe we should try a little harder. They'll come in there. Oh, I got a refusal. Throw it down. Wait a minute. Let's talk about this just a little bit more. Why did he refuse? Oh, he said he didn't have time. Oh, he said he hates the government. Oh, he said this. And they're just ready to get rid of it. That happens everywhere. I've heard it, and I know it does. Okay. What I tell them to do, and I tell it up front now, though, enumerators have to be in on every bit of this. I tell them, instead of feeling all those bad feelings that you feel like that, Put your energy into motion. Start thinking this. Who might be able in our group to get this thing off of my back? I hate this refusal. Start using that brain. Turn in those little wheels and go to thinking, hmm, he was a sheep and goat rancher. Maybe we've got that guy that's got those sheep and goats that works with us. Maybe if he went out there and talked to him, he might could get it. You see, we've got to change their mindset. We can't let them go in there and say, you're sending somebody behind me. You don't trust me? You think That's the first thing they're going to do if you don't introduce it right. They're going to be mad. What do you think? I didn't do everything right? So you've got to be the salesperson. Here's another sale. The field supervisor has got to make that enumerator get to that point that when they come through that door to see you, they already say it. I think maybe if we send so and so out there, they could get this for me and get this old refusal off of it. You see the difference there? So they've got to be brought in on that from day one. 
So before they ever go out there, they say, well, okay, we got a group effort here. Everybody in here is a refusal getter, and everybody in here is a refusal converter. See? Nobody's single out. So, do let some of the people will be better than others, but try to use everybody. Out of my 24 enumerators, I've had 16 of them that have converted refusals at this time. The other ones haven't because they don't work the arms survey and they don't have as many opportunities. I've had people that switched questionnaires and went out there two weeks later and got each other's questionnaires. All these things can happen. You can still get a refusal on that second visit, but you've at least got another chance there. Okay, here's how it has to work, and you have to tell them that day one on this, and the enumerators, remember, have to be a part of this. Okay, enumerator number one goes out there. He gets a refusal. He comes back in. But by the time he gets to me, I can hear him already talking to that other one that he thinks might could convert this one. But they get together. They talk about everything that happened while they were out there. They discuss it. So enumerator number two takes it, goes out there, converts that thing. It's a win-win. Enumerator number one got a refusal off their back, right? Enumerator number two got one more completion on his record. That's good. Okay, here's the second part of it, though. Enumerator number one goes out there, gets the refusal. Enumerator number two takes that questionnaire, goes back to the field, he cannot talk him into it. It's still a refusal. Here's why it has to revert back to number one. Because we could never find any number twos. They'd have to be stupid, right? So, <laughs> I wouldn't want somebody that stupid working with me. So, you've got to tell them, okay, if it stays a refusal, it'll stay on number one. You'll be surprised how enumerator number one tries to encourage number two. Because they're not out there. You see how it's turned completely from, you're sending somebody behind me, you don't trust me to get this thing off me. Let's see who can do it. Sometimes he'll come in and jump right in the middle of me and say, I think if you got off your and went out there, you might can get it. And I have to do it. You know, there's been times that our state director, he was on, I was on an interview with rice growers in the state of Texas. I was down talking to him and he said, I'm not gonna do anything with y'all. Y'all don't care anything about the Texas producer. Y'all took all the figures from Louisiana and Mississippi. I had no idea what he was talking about. And I told him right off the bat, oh, I can't help you with that, that's over my head. I know somebody that can. I immediately called our state director. He was got on that phone. He talked to the man 45 minutes. I didn't know it was that long-winded, but he did. <laughs> 45 minutes later, that guy said, well, come on in here. I, I'll do that. I see what happened now. See, we got a lot of resources out there we can use that we're not using. Those enumerators need to know that. They don't need to everything they got called a state director. They need to be advised on what something like that. I'm not going to bother a state director on some kind of petty thing like I hate the government. Which brings another thing in there. <laughs> Whenever they tell us, oh no, I hate the government, I don't like anything about it. One of the things David can do when he goes out there and what I do, we don't want to throw that enumerator before us under the bus, do we? So let's don't even mention their name. What we like to do is we say, a lot of times they don't even know that we were with the same one and we'll just proceed with that. But however, we go behind that other one and they said, he was out here. Say, well, I'm out here, but, but they sent me out here. They, we kind of use it like that. They sent me out here to make sure nobody from our agency has done anything to upset you. Ah, see, that's when we can find out all sorts of things. <laughs> Some of them we don't want to find out. <laughs> I find out such things as, yeah, a wallet, I said that about driving down the road while ago. This guy comes down here in this diesel pickup, he's throwing dirt all over the place. I, if I'd have had a gun, I'd have shot him. Whoops, I gotta do something about that, don't I? Mm hmm okay. I had this lady that came out here. She had on shorts, and she had on 
one of those tops and she just looked like a, she was going to the beach. That wasn't what he said. I cleaned that up. <laughs> he said, and if my wife would have driven up, she would have killed us both. And I wasn't going to talk to her. I wasn't good at her as fast as I go. I got to do something about that, don't I? Okay? We've had all sorts of little things that's happened like that. That, that we need to clean up. We have things that they tell us. Um, well, this guy came out here and he had on a suit. You can get overdressed. He had on a suit and tie. He acted like he is Mr. Government. I didn't want him around here. Cool. Proper dress. See all these things that can happen because you're not going out there. And when I say you, I'm, I'm used to talking to enumerators and field supervisors. And it's because you have done something wrong. So you need, that field supervisor needs to talk to those people. They need to say, we're gonna do this, we're gonna dress like this. You say you can't tell somebody how to dress? I can. <laughs> and if they're not doing it, you need to get rid of them. Because that field supervisor, it's their duty to tell somebody what to wear appropriate. I'm not saying wear something from Ralph Lauren or something, that's not my point. But you need to be dressed properly, like all of y'all are dressed properly in here today. Those enumerators are on the job, and it's our duty to make sure that they go out there and they act like. I had somebody to tell me, she comes in here and she smells my whole house up with that old perfume, with those old cigarettes. I gotta do something about it, and I do immediately. I tell them. And I thank that producer for telling me that, because it helps her. I say, we're out here working for you. We're using your taxpayer money out here. And I appreciate your help, and I will do something about it. You'd be surprised at how many times I can send somebody like David behind some of those problems. Say, is it okay if I send this man out here? Now, he was a county agent for lots of years. Or can I send this man out here? He worked for Texas A&M, and he did this and that. And they'll say, yeah, you send somebody out here decent, and I'll talk to him. <laughs> so a lot of that you do need to see. There's no such thing as a certain kind of a numerator. They don't have to look any way. They don't have to be young or old. Their race doesn't matter. Their gender doesn't matter. But you've got to find somebody that knows how to go out there and meet that public. That's number one. I can clean up a questionnaire. And that's my job, by the way, to clean it up before Tanisha gets it. I'm supposed to clean that questionnaire up. Y'all shouldn't have a bunch of bull coming in there. But because it's not a, if you get something in that office that's bad, it's not because you've got a bad enumerator out there. It's because you've got a bad supervisor out there. They need to clean them up before they come in there. So, I'm trying to get off that sub box there. But you do need to talk to that enumerator and let them know what's expected of them the day you hire them. And remind them before each survey. Go over just what I just said. I want you to dress appropriately. I want you to have your introduction down. I want you to be able to go up there, put that hand out like David said. Shake that hand. I don't care if it's a man or a woman. Shake that hand. Start talking to them immediately. Okay, I think I've just about yelled about everything I can at this point. So we're, okay, Let's see if I've got anything else. Uh, notes. Y'all keep talking about notes. We cannot make too many notes on a questionnaire. I was looking over here. I've seen Ter Tanisha have to do this. Y'all have to go in there and fill some of that stuff out. If we don't get an exact answer, why don't we go over to the side of that and write what we think? We've been out there, right? We drove out there. Like, Y'all paid us to drive out there. So we have looked, and if he says, oh, I'm not gonna tell you anything about my spouse's, uh, what she makes, She's a school teacher and she would get mad if I told her. Ah, isn't that better for Tanisha and the Texas office to know that she's a school teacher and she's got to put something in there or we have to? Then is she uh, a model that with a modeling agency that makes $150,000 a picture? You know, those kind of things. <laughs> it doesn't hurt to put it in there. All the information we can put in there. Y'all shouldn't have to sit there in that office. If that supervisor's doing their job, y'all shouldn't have to sit there in that office and figure a lot of these things out. It should be done right out there. 
in that field when that enumerator sits beside you. Oh, that's another thing. I would never send a questionnaire in that I had graded like I was a school teacher. How do they do that? I sit beside somebody. They come in and they sit right beside me on my right side because I'm right-handed and they got to sit at a certain place in my office, which I know a lot of people don't have offices, but you're going to meet them somewhere. So they sit right beside me. We go through that questionnaire. Somebody up here presenting said my favorite thing. It tells a story. And if that don't tell that story and you don't understand that story of their life when you get through, somebody's messed up. And uh, Tanisha and I, I'm talking about her again. We call a lot of, I don't know if y'all do or not, but we got so many butt biters in that questionnaire. By that, I don't, do y'all use that term or is it just? <laughs> data relationships. Oh, okay. <laughs> data relationship. Okay, better one. That's not what we call them, so, but I'll try to remember that. But they're really butt biters. And the reason they're that. When you start out at the beginning of that questionnaire and you tell me he harvested 50,000 bales of cotton and he bought so many cattle and he had them on hand and he uh, harvested so much wheat and he did this and he did that, that stuff's got to disappear before that questionnaire is over. It's either got to disappear or it's got to be in storage. So that's what I look at when I added a questionnaire in the field. If he had it, he either got to have it still in storage, he had to sell it, he had to give it away, he had to eat it, he had to do something because it's got to go away from the first to the end of that. Data relationship, is that it? Okay. <laughs> that is what we need to, to tell them up front. If, you, if he produces it and it appears, let it go away before the end. And that's what I ask, well, what happened to this? Oh, he didn't tell me. I want to know. So you're going to have to go back and ask him, or we're going to have to figure out what happened to this that he produced. The same thing about if he had land that he owned, land that he rented and so forth, got to have some value back there. Those are the kind of things that data relations, that we need, I know y'all work with it, but we need to work a little bit more with those enumerators and say, that questionnaire starts out and finishes, it's gonna to have to tell that story before it gets to the end. Okay, I think I just <laughs> yelled about enough now. I keep forgetting I've got on a microphone and I've got a big voice, so. Okay, I think I've covered everything that I was going to cover. And at this time, I'd like to have lots of questions besides just Matt. I appreciate that question. That was a good start for it. Okay. Come on, somebody. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's more of a comment to add to the list of things that you said and what, what he said as far as approaching the farmer and introducing yourself, business card and all that. We have one enumerator that we like to glean information out of her about every workshop that we have. Um, we have an enumerator that we really like to glean information from because she's an exceptional enumerator. And the first thing she says is be organized. Whether of it's course. Mm -hmm. whether you have a business card you're going to give, or a pamphlet, or an annual summary, or something, but be ready to give that to the farmer and have it readily available. Don't say, "Well, let me run back to the car for a minute. I'll get it." You know, don't don't do that. Be organized and be ready to go. And like you said, you're probably not going to do the interview on the first visit. You're going to come back most likely, but still be organized with your. Uh, be ready for your responses. Be ready to give him something, but be organized and, and show him that you know what you're talking about and you're not. They are wasting his time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Did we go into? Uh, makes me think of something right there. I, you, you jogged my memory on something. I once had a person on that be organized that said, "Well, when she drove up here, she went to the back of her car, her trunk open, and messed around with the longest. I thought she was getting a gun to come in here and rob us. <laughs> That's a bad thing." Being organized, having it in your hand, jumping out of that car and hitting that door. Think if you lived out in the country and you look out there and somebody in five minutes is digging in that trunk or digging in that back seat. It does make you wonder, doesn't it? So that's another thing. Thanks for that one. Um, when you go out and do cold visits for like Arms Phase 3 
and obviously you want to see him eye to eye and, and try to talk him into doing the interview. But if you don't catch him at home, do you guys leave your business cards in the door or yes. how do you go about doing that? Then obviously they call you back and say, That's why wonderful that they call us back. That, that's, you know, obviously they don't most of the time. <laughs> but if they do, that's, that's, that's our dream. We leave business cards and we also leave a note with those door hangers as much as we can. Because if we've driven, in our case, sometimes 100 miles or 50 or more miles to go and talk to that person, we certainly don't want that to be wasted. So we had rather leave something there with them and say, I will call you, or you may call me at this number. And if they hadn't called you, say, I will call you about seven o'clock tonight. And give them a time, be precise. And if they hadn't called you by seven, then call them and tell them I was out there and I just want to see when would be a good time, just like David said. Don't ever push them. Say, I'm gonna hour your time right now. That's gonna make them mad right off the bat. So that is a very good idea. Saw another hand over there. Anybody? <laughs> um, I have a question about costs. I mean, I know it's good to convert a refusal, obviously, but does that increase your cost a lot? I'm glad you asked that. That's something I've left out. Which would you rather have? And I'm going to ask some people in the back this. <laughs> Which would you rather have? And I'm just going to grab these numbers because I don't know. Would you rather have a $100 refusal or a $200 completed questionnaire? What are you going to get more out of? Completed. That's what I always tell them. That bothers the enumerators. Oh, I think it's going to drive my cost up. I'll vouch for you. This is just one. You've gone out and got 21 that you went on the first or second time. This is one and it's that important. So I'd rather have, a, let's say, a $150 question, uh, $250 questionnaire than a $150 one. And I believe that the powers that be would rather have that too. What have we got with that, re that $100 refusal? Nothing. We have nothing to show for that. So. Uh, that's something that they could probably answer better, but that's what I always tell the enumerators, and our costs have never been over our state average, and they've always been below the U.S. average. So it must not, and we've been doing this for several years. We do get 95 to 97 percent completion rate. Kathy, could you that what we, your response rate again? Will you repeat it again? I wonder if I can hear it. What? Uh, your response rate. The lowest I've ever had is 92. The highest is 97. If we got below 90, I can't imagine what would happen to me or anybody in my group if we got below 90. Because whenever... We need that across all of y'all. And, and I want to tell you something else. We share. I share all the information that they send from that state office to me on everybody's calls with everybody may not be good, but it is for us. They want to see that. Oh my gosh, how come mine run 283 and hers was only 170? They look at that stuff and they want to know. I think that's a good tool for them to know that we're really monitoring that and we're looking at, at that. They also have figured out if they go out and they complete five more questionnaires that weren't even theirs, that we divide their completions to find and into that to find out what they're oh let me have four more my, my I think right now mine's a little high can I try those four they want them see we got to get them to think in that way instead of trying to make them think the other way but also that two hundred dollars investment that you put we put in to convert that person from a refusal to a positive report when we go back to visit that person for our guild or ag surveys you know that, you know, it would be a positive, you know, something that, you know, it's a usable report, and that's, you know, other was uh, a refusal. So just right. think about it from a perspective. I'd rather invest that $200 now than keep on investing $100 over and over again. Yes, sir. So. And we like to leave them feeling good. Even if they refuse us, we'll say, well, we understand. We sure wish we could have gotten it, but... We understand. We never get upset with them. If they get upset and start cursing at us or something, we just leave. We don't ever say anything back. We just leave. That's the best thing to do. I've had people before say, then he said this, and then he said that. Why did you stay there that long? <laughs> That's stupid. 
get up and go to your car. If he's saying all those filthy words, he's not going to do it, and we don't even want him to. It's, at that point, it's time to get out of there. and just. But don't say anything whatsoever to him, and don't say, I'm sorry. You're not sorry. You're doing your job. Just say, well, I wish you didn't feel that way, or something along those lines, but you've got your right. And uh, this is voluntary. And leave, you know. But feel good about it. That's what those enumerators have got to keep feeling good. We can't make them feel real bad, really bad about a refusal. They've got to know right up front they're going to get one. And they've got to know that that shows what kind of character they have and how good of an enumerator they are once they get it. If you drive out there and everybody out there says, come on in. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> you can't even prove how good you are, can you? And another thing, while I'm on this uh, part of it, we can have these state schools, or we can have the state schools, we can have anything, and we can teach them how to fill out a questionnaire. I can teach fifth graders how to fill out a questionnaire. I can get anybody out on that street and teach them how to do professional interviewing. That's not what we need in this job. Those supervisors need to find somebody that's got the personality that can drive up there, sell themselves in two minutes, and make them want to give it. Let them understand what's in it for me. And if you don't do that and don't get that ability, and you can't teach that, you honestly can't. So they need to look for somebody that's been in some type of profession or that somebody that's got that gift to go out there and meet these people. I have, a, I have a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, one of the enumerators out in Kansas, he has you know sky high response rates. And one thing that he does is he looks for something slightly unique on that operation, uh, like a 1940s Plessy Ferguson tractor or something like that. And uh, oh, this guy does, yeah. And, and starts a conversation like, oh hey, that's a, that's a neat old tractor that Plessy Ferguson tractor. And he just starts a conversation before they know it. You know they're doing the questionnaire, or doing, you know. And, um, but my question is. Um, in years past, you know, you had the version five, the core that was mailed out twice, and then we get called out to the field on the ones that haven't returned it yet. Uh, this one's going to be mailed out. Do you, when in your introduction and trying to sell yourself and selling the survey, do you tweak that a little bit, knowing that they basically refused twice already by no. not even sending it in? You no. don't tweak it at all. It, Never say a word until they do. The best thing to do on that, on course, and we're going to do it on this is to go out there like you're the first time that, that you've been out there, and they'll say, well, I got that through the mail. Yeah, they mail them out a time or so, but I've even said stuff like, ha, oh, you didn't mail it in. That means that I get to come out here and talk to you. That sort of thing. Pass it off quickly. Don't make a big deal out of anything, except the fact that we do really do need this information and why we need it. But if you'll just get that out there real fast about Oh, yeah, that's right. They did mail them from the office. That's why I'm getting to come out here. You see, there's a difference between, and if you go up there at first and say, you didn't mail this in, what does that sound like? You're fussing at them for not mailing it in, so don't do that. Just go out there and start to do this and say, well, I got to have something through the mail. Yeah, you probably did. I think they mailed a bunch of them things out. But I, I'll have to fill it out. We'll get rid of that thing right now. Isn't that a lot faster than, than going out and saying, you didn't, I've actually had an enumerator come in and say, oh, I messed up. See, he thought I was fussing at him and he got him upset. We can't do that. Just go out there and just do it cold turkey like you don't even know he's got that. David, how do you approach situations where from something that the respondent said or something that you noticed about the operation, you know that in one particular answer, he's not giving you the full story, either because you know he's just not thinking about that he does have that side business, or he's partnering with his brother and operating another farm, or maybe he just doesn't, you know, he, he needs a little arm twisting. So do you, what do you do in that situation? First of all, when I go out to do an interview, I assume that what the people that, that I'm interviewing uh, give me is correct. I don't try to question them 
as far as what they're giving me. Now, so that said, if I know that they're into some other business, I'll, I'll probably press them on, on that and say, what about this uh, other operation? Sometimes it's in that particular operation, and sometimes it may be associated with another operation that they're doing too. So, But I will press it to some point. But what I found out is that once they tell you something, you, you have to take what they're giving you as the truth and don't try to start questioning them because if you start doing that they're not they're going to climb up and not give you anything i got to tell you one more thing about converting refusals uh, david was a number two enumerator on a refusal this lady had got had this doctor somebody and uh she had called a thousand times because she'd been to his house and there's a gated place there and all this stuff she didn't Tried to go to his place and they, they would not um, talk to him at all for, at his office. She finally called and called and uh, he said, the only way I can talk to anybody would be between appointments. When I go home at night, I'm not going to talk to anybody about anything. So if you can catch me Monday through Friday between appointments at my doctor's office, then maybe I can give you that information. It wasn't that big of a deal. He was just a cattle operator, but we still needed it. So David got on, he called him, and he said, Roy, if you want to, you can come between appointments, but that's not be the only way, and I don't know if it'd be one hour, two hours, three hours, or whatever, when I get a few minutes. And David said, I'll be there. David went there. He went to the receptionist and told them what he wanted, and she said, well, if you'll sit here and wait, I'll call you between appointments. David didn't know when he got there or before he got there, he was OBGYN. <laughs> David sat for three hours with pregnant women waiting for this man. He said he sure got some funny looks, but he got him. He said, we gotta be willing to do anything it takes. And that is our motto, by the way. Whatever it takes. And we got that from an enumerator that's now dead, an older lady. She once said, I said, how did you get this person? Oh, he's tough. She said, oh, I went over there, and she said, I went by and left a hanger, and he came to my hotel room. I said, don't tell me. <laughs> and so I said, whatever it takes. Of course, she was a military lady, and about 80 years old, and it, was, it wouldn't have been that funny if it would have been anybody else. And, and we've always <laughs> laughed about that. You know, and so our motto is now, whatever it takes. So... And like I say, we are a group, and we work together as a group. And we don't look at individual records as much as we do our group record. What did we do this time? That's what they want to know. If I get somebody in there that goes below 89, I don't have to say a word to them. Them enumerators will make them feel so uncomfortable because they go out there and they'll do whatever it takes that next time for them to get above 90. Because you get somebody in that group that jumps down below 90, they're going to feel bad. I don't have to make them feel bad. They will. Because they pulled our group down. Well, thank okay. you very much. Sheila tells me I have the last question. And it's how can we help you? Um, we can't give you the talent to go out and talk to people like this. But um, in terms of stories about how ARMS data makes an impact or anecdotes, what things are the most valuable to you or what things are missing that you wish we could give you give you that you don't have? I think it's field supervisory training. I think that they need to be told more of what's expected of them. We have, uh, we have meetings, supervisor meetings, but we just talk about things that they gripe about what's going on or something. I think that, that we need to not feel like that we're out there just not getting the direction we should. A lot of people aren't as uh, out there as I am. And they, they'll say, well, I'm afraid if I do that. Those field supervisors need to know how much power they do have and what, how much that y'all do expect them to do. And they need to set a numerator group happy and wanting to work. 
Because most of the people that we have as enumerators don't have to work. If they had to do this job for a living, they couldn't live because it's between times. So we've got to have a people out there. So the tool that we would need the most, I think, is a little bit more uh, pushing on the field supervisors to, to make that work. When that work hits that state office, if y'all believe that, oh, that enumerator is terrible, if you can pick that out, there's nothing wrong with that enumerator. That's that field supervisor that sent it in. It went through them. They got their initials on it. So if they send you in a bunch of nothing, they need that training. They need to be told, this is what you're going to do to remain a field supervisor. I work with Charles Wallace. Do y'all remember him? <laughs> I'm about the only one left. Everybody else just about quit. But you did it. When he told you, you did what he told you because you didn't want to be almost killed. So we, we, we did. But that's what we need. We need some tough people to tell us, this is what you do. And then you need to recognize if they've done good or bad. Okay. Do I need to get out from here? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Well. something like that. <laughs> um.